Good to see everybody. Good to be here with you. <clears throat> Can we pray? Let's pray together. Lord, we, we bow, um, Lord, uh, not out of ritual, but out of reverence. We know that when your word is preached and your people are gathered, you are present. This is no ordinary event. This is not another thing on the calendar. This is not one more experience. This is the people of God gathered around the risen Christ. And so give us attentive hearts worthy of the resurrected Christ. Give us humility before your holy word to, as James says, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. Lord, plant good things in our hearts this afternoon, and let there be much fruit, much joy, much renewing and reviving and restoring of souls. We ask it in Jesus' name. Well, last week we considered the heart of rest. Uh, that we looked at an ambitious heart and how it needs to be swapped out for an awestruck heart in order to experience spiritual rest. And uh, we can't, at any given week, just kind of retreat into monastic cells to experience ongoing spiritual renewal, right? There is work to go to. There are children to raise. And so how do we cultivate that awestruck heart in the midst of our lives? Psalm 19 shows us how to do this by bringing two things together, two seemingly unrelated things. In the first half, uh, creation the second half, revelation. In the, in the first half, the world around us. In the second half, God's word to us. And so what's the connection between creation and revel, revelation? How do these things work together to create a life of spiritual renewal, a devotional life? Let's take a look at them. Creation, revelation, and then response. Creation. Creation speaks. The heavens declare. The skies pour forth speech. The night displays knowledge. The sky proclaims. Creation has a voice. Creation speaks. Uh, when it says it pours forth, the word means to gush like a geezer, like a fountain, to overflow. In other words, creation's speech and creation's song is not intermittent, but it's continual. It's a continual refrain. It's so good, it's like hitting repeat on your favorite Spotify song. It's just so good, you just keep on listening to it. Creation's tune is on heavy rotation, and it's no dirge. Look with me at Verse 5, it comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, like a strong man running his course with joy. You ever witnessed a spouse on their wedding day? Just down in the dumps, right? No. <laughs> you know, that, that, glide, that bride just glides down the aisle. The, 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 the groom is quivering for joy at the front. Gladness and joy. The sun is an image of happiness. The strong man. You ever seen a, an Olympic athlete? Focused determination, running that race. They run through the finish line and then their arms shoot up in elation. What kind of song is creation singing continually? It's a joyful song. Creation is singing joyfully. Creation is singing continually. Well, what is it singing about? 
I mean, I want to get in on that. What is it saying that is so good it's worth repeating over and over and over? Well, that's the problem. Creation's song is inaudible. Verse 3, there is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. We can't hear the refrain of all creation. We don't know why it's happy. We just know that it's happy. Well, some people say, you know, I, I don't need to go to church. You know, I, I worship in creation. I find renewal in culture. Creation and culture are my church, my Place, place of renewal. And I, I love creation. <laughs> Went on a backpacking trip with my son not too long ago, the Appalachian Trail. I love culture. Went to War and Drugs a couple weeks ago. Watched a great movie. Well, I watched a bad movie this week and a great movie a couple weekends ago. But, you know, I love creation. I love culture. I'm sure you do too. But what is creation and what is culture saying? You say, well, isn't it pointing to God? You know, creation pointing that God exists. Yes, but what kind of God? There is no interpreter in creation. On the hike, you don't find a, a, a little book that tells you about the attributes of God. You don't know what kind of being you might be worshiping. If you get poison ivy, you might think, He's a mean-spirited God. You get bitten by a snake, that he's a vengeful God. You see a beautiful sunset, you think he's an artistic God. You see an incredible mountain, you think he's a reliable God. You're just left to figure it out, right? We don't know what to believe. When I asked my 10-year-old why she likes Dua Lipa's Levitate, she doesn't comment on the lyrics, she doesn't even know what they mean. She just knows she likes the music, like everybody else. <laughs> Worshiping in creation without revelation, without the book of Scripture is like fangirling a song when you don't even know the meaning. It's seeking experience over substance. And many of us bring that experience addiction into the church. Reducing the church to one more event, lining it up next to Netflix and a hiking. Yeah, the, the worship was good. The preacher's okay. Nobody talked to me. We just line it up, compare it to the brunch we had that morning, to the film we saw the night before. And we miss creation's praise. The song of the cosmos falls on deaf ears. It is conducting a continual worship service full of joy. But without the lyrics, we remain on the outside of its praise. We need someone to hand us the liner notes so we can sing. Along And the second half of this psalm hands us the words to creation's praise. Look at verse 7 and following. The law of the Lord is perfect. The testimony of the Lord is sure. The precepts of the Lord are right. The law, the testimony, the precepts, the commandments, the rules... What, what does all of this mean? There's no tight theological nuance between all of these words. It is a, is a poetic parallelism meant to reinforce what? The centrality of God's word. The absolute importance of God's word. Repeated over and over. But often we're more preoccupied with human words than we are divine words. 
Think about how many words you take in a day. The words you read on your texts, on your Facebook feed, on your Instagram. The conversations you have at work. The movies and films that we watch. Words, words, words. Words that we are often much more attentive to than the divine, perfect, pure, sure, true words of God. How many of us take in God's words as though they are this important? You can't say that of all the other words on your social media feed and on your movies. You can't say that they're pure and they're reliable and they're true and they're perfect and they're soul restoring. There's only one place where you can bank on that and it's in the book of Scripture. The word of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The word perfect means whole. Anybody feel unwhole? Anyone unwhole this morning? Except we're all unwhole. Well, the word of the Lord makes whole. It's perfect. Sure, the word of the Lord is sure. That means firm, but not just firm. It means it's verified. It's fact-checked. It's right every time. It's always reliable. The word of the Lord is sure. It's also right. It is righteous. It is good. You want some good news? Good news here doesn't get any better. It's clean. It's pure. You can trust the motives of the author every single time. There's no, no pulling the wool over your eyes. There's no manipulation. It's way better than CNN and Fox. It is pure. It is clean. It is true. What's true mean? It's true. <laughs> Not a flaw in it. Not warped in any way. From top to bottom, right to left, all the way through, it is 100% true. In a world of spin and hype, of outrage, and cancel culture, you'd think we would be obsessing over these words. Right? Because our culture is filled with opposite words. Hateful words, mean words, doubting words, skeptical words, deconstructing words, hateful words. It's filled with all that. But here it's pure, it's reliable, it's true, it's clean. I mean, you'd think we'd be obsessed with these words. But we're not. We're obsessed with the other words. Attentive to the fleeting words. And you can tell because Christians are anxious, they're fearful, they're bored, they're exhausted. When we should be among the most joyful, most lively, most energized and encouraging people on the planet. Why? Because the word of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. Now that's a people whose soul is restored, the unwhole made whole, the heart rejoiced. You say, well, why? Why would that be the case? Because the law of the Lord is perfect, and it does restore the soul. <laughs> Do you want joy? Do you want revival of heart? Do you desire to be happy? Attend to God's perfect word. Train your heart and your mind on the words that are pure, that are true, that are right, that are perfect, that are clean. God's word. You see, but it, it's kind of boring. I find the Bible boring. Well, that's because you're used to prioritizing experience over substance. Remember the comparisons? 
dopamine over depth. We've scorched our appetite for God, and we find his book uninteresting. You say, I'm already familiar with God's word, but are you familiar with his speech, with the timbre of his voice, the intimacy of his character? You might know the verses and the stories and the letters, be very familiar and yet very unfamiliar. With God's speech, God's heart, God's person and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So how do we overcome this familiar yet unfamiliar dilemma? How do we get past the boredom into the richness of God's word? Several things to think about as we read God's word. First, preparation. Think about how you prepare for a movie. You watch the trailer ahead of time. You buy tickets in advance. You might talk to some friends about it. You kind of get a little bit excited about the movie. You show up uh, in enough time to, to get the concessions and to make your way to the seat and hopefully sit down and watch some bumpers at Alamo before the movie comes on. And then you give yourself over to the movie for an hour and a half, two hours, you're glued to the screen. You prepare for the movie. You eliminate distraction and focus yourself on the moving screen. How much more should we prepare to hear God's words? The pure and trustworthy words. Set aside some time. Anticipate hearing from him. Start with 20 minutes in a quiet place, a familiar place. Prepare to hear God's word. Second, immersion, preparation, And immersion. When we're watching the movie, we give ourselves over entirely to it, right? We're absorbed with the plot. We look for holes. We 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 dive into the characters. Are they believable? Can I identify? We 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 immerse ourselves into the story and open ourselves up to its message. We're absorbed into the film. What if we Immersed ourselves in God's word. Turned on our imagination and thought about the characters and the plot, the promises and the warnings. We thought about Jesus. This little passage in the gospel says that Jesus walked beside the sea of Galilee. What does that tell us about Jesus? He enjoyed creation. He Went for a walk by the sea. What about the story of Jesus turning water into wine? What does this tell us about Jesus? That he is Lord over creation. He can manipulate the atomic elements and turn water into wine. He enjoys creation. He's Lord of creation. He is Lord of joy, when you get wine, you get joy, you get happiness, you get a banquet, a wedding, a festival. He is the Lord of joy. Slowing down, immersing ourselves in the stories of Scripture. Third, meditation. Now, this word occurs 19 times in the Psalms, and half of them are related to God's word. So, meditating on God's word. That means to read slowly. The word meditate means to murmur, to to mutter, to roll the words around in your mind to get the meaning until they activate your heart, until they seize your heart. What do do they mean? What do the words mean? What's the intention? 
What does it tell me about God? How does God want me to respond and meditate? What are they saying? What does it tell me about God? How do you want me to respond? Preparation, immersion, meditation. God's words are much more important than our words. He is primary. We are secondary. His words are ultimate. His words are pure and true. And if that's the case, then it's much more important that we hear from God than he hear from us. You see, meditation is not initiative. It is response. His sight, his words. The psalmist says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. It's his sight and his words that are most important to the psalmist. Meditation on the divine words. Thomas Watson reminds us that too often we walk away from the word of God cold-hearted because we failed to warm our souls at the fires of meditation. Too often we walk away from the word of God cold-hearted because we failed to warm our souls at the fires of meditation. Prepare, immerse, and meditate. It will revive the soul. Creation, revelation, and response. How should we respond? I'm so glad you asked. Verses 12 to 14 describe a response. The response is humble, it's hopeful, and it is devotional. Hopeful, humble, devotional. Humble. What does he say in response to this this word? He says, who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from my hidden faults. Keep me back, your servant, back from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Each of those Sentences are a plea. Who can discern his errors? You can't, I can't. Declare me innocent. Keep me back. Don't let me be dominated by sin. It's a a person in touch with God's voice. A person acquainted with his holiness. A person asking to be spared. Held back from sin. Each day I pray the Lord's Prayer in the mornings and I ask the Lord to deliver me from evil. And I name the sins of the season. Some sins are sins we fight all of life and some sins are more seasonal. Lord, deliver me from lust. Lord, deliver me from control. Lord, deliver me from pride. Lord, deliver me from false guilt. Lord, deliver me. The psalmist is humble, dependent, pleading. Are you pleading with God? He's inclined to deliver you. Are you desperate for God? He wants to rescue you. We respond Humbly, not just humbly, but also hopefully. Uh, Picking up in verse 12, declare me innocent from my hidden faults. I shall be blameless and innocent of great trans. It's like he expects to be considered innocent. How could you? I mean, you just talked about all your sins and all your evils and how you're, you're a mess. You pleaded with God. How could you be so confident that God would consider you blameless and innocent? Well, he knows God's voice. He sees God's mercy in the scriptures. He knows his heart and his character. 
knows God's desire is to declare innocent and to make us blameless. But if we are declared blameless, who's going to take the blame? If we are to be innocent, then who will be found guilty? Jesus is wrapped in our blame in order to wrap us in his blamelessness. Jesus is clothed in our guilt so that we can be considered guiltless. Jesus is clothed in our unrighteousness that we might be dressed in his righteousness. Ah, there's the hopeful mercy and grace of God. This is Christ for you. Your blame on him, his blamelessness on you. This is Christ for you. The sins you thought about when I was going through my sins placed on him. and His righteousness placed on you. This is Christ for you. That disinterest and that boredom. Thank God Christ did not get bored or disinterested in evil sinners like us. But was so interested, he suffered and died in our place to give us the blameless, guilt-free, righteous standing before God. What a Savior. Christ for us. And you can see he's getting pretty devotional. He's getting pretty worshipful in his heart. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Everything now is straining towards God. Everything is mouth, his heart, his meditation, his desires. It's all straining forward to God. His deepest self, his heart, wants to be pleasing to God. And this, this word-shaped, revelation-prompted response unlocks creation's praise. You can feel the happiness as he ends the psalm. The word of God has opened up the song of the cosmos, the, the joy of worshiping our creator and redeemer. So now he sees the glory of God in creation, and he knows what kind of God is there. There's no guesswork left after the encounter with Revelation. A rock is no longer a rock. It becomes a symbol of the sturdy, faithful, steadfast God he worships. A sunset is no longer a flash of fading color, but a reminder of God's unwaning joy breaking the tape, arms up in elation. A film like Nightmare Alley, no longer a temporary distraction, an experience that we chase, but a reminder that we are all born for an insufferable role unless we receive deliverance. From a merciful Savior. The, the war on drugs is not just an experience, but it's pointing to substances. Adam sings, We're all just walking through this darkness all alone. But then Revelation sings, The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Reviving the soul. You see, God's word unlocks creation's praise. And then we can have a devotional life wherever we go. We begin to see the character and promises of God in creation and culture. Revealing his truth. Unveiling his character. Showing his beauty. Unfurling his goodness. But to get beyond the experience addiction, to substance, to break through the boredom, we need to prepare. We need to immerse 
need to meditate and listen for God's voice, his speech, the timber of the mighty and the merciful God. With the book of Scripture in one hand and the book of nature in the other, living a devotional 